I'm comedian and writer Alexandria Love. Today, me and my best friend Scotch are very excited about this episode of Drunkaturgy because we're going to talk all about civil rights icon and American hero, Congressman John Lewis. To try to pack over a half century of accomplishments, accomplishments that changed the foundation of our country into a few minutes long video is going to be quite a challenge. But as the Bible says, I can do all things through booze, which strengthens me. It's Leviticus, don't look it up. Born in 1941 in Troy, Alabama, John grew up on his family's farm and attended segregated public schools in Pike County, Alabama. In 1955, the Montgomery bus boycotts and speeches give, given by Dr. King inspired John to be a part of the National Civil Rights Movement. So throughout the 60s, John would be a major player in every civil rights protest. In 1961, he became one of the first 13 Freedom Riders, groups of black and white college students and civil rights activists who participated in bus trips throughout the American South protesting segregated bus terminals. Their goal was to test a 1960s decision by the Supreme Court, which rendered the segregation of interstate, interstate transportation facilities unconstitutional. While the courts did decide this in Morgan v. Virginia and then again in Boynton v. Virginia, it wasn't enforced, which John and his friends found to be, uh, what's the legal term? Bullshit? It does mirror what's happening today in 2020. For example, it is illegal for police officers to murder unarmed black civilians. But as the police officers that murdered Breonna Taylor know, this is a law that's rarely enforced. Brent Hankison, uh, John Mattingly, and Miles Cosgrove are their names, by the way, in case you're wondering. So the Freedom Riders, their membership started out with just 13 people, but over the course of a few weeks, it would number in the hundreds. And they did test that Supreme Court decision. Black writers used white-only restrooms and lunch counters in Southern states, making white people go, what in tarnation? Or whatever it is white people do when they're upset. Fast forward to May of 1961, the writers split into two separate groups on separate buses. The first bus arrives in Anniston, Alabama on May 14th. A mob of about 200 white people surround the bus causing the driver to not stop at their destination. But the mob followed the bus in cars. And when the bus got a flat tire and had to stop, the taggers threw rocks and bricks, they slashed tires, they smashed windows with pipes and axes and threw a firebomb into a broken window. A few hours later, the second bus arrives in Birmingham, Alabama, and black and white passengers on a trailways bus were beaten bloody after they entered whites only waiting rooms and restaurants at bus terminals. The Birmingham Public Safety Commissioner, Bull Connor, stated that although he knew the Freedom Riders were arriving and that violence awaited them, he posted no police protection because it was Mother's Day. If you're white, you're probably thinking, I can't believe they used such a bullshit excuse to deny safety to peaceful protesters. And if you're black, you're probably thinking, the writers were charged with what they called a breach of peace. And they responded with a strategy they called jail, no bail, which was a deliberate effort to clog up the penal facilities. Most of the 300 writers in Jackson would spend six weeks in the jail cells that were rife with mice and insects and soiled mattresses. <sighs> By 1963, John Lewis was already a nationally recognized leader. He was dubbed one of the big six of the civil rights movement, and he was 23 at the time. What were you doing when you were 23? You wanna know what I was doing when I was 23? I have no idea, thanks to Cannabis Sativa. March 7th, 1965, Hosea Williams, another notable civil rights leader, and John Lewis led over 600 peaceful protesters across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, they intended to march from Selma to Montgomery to demonstrate the need for voting rights in the state. The marchers were attacked by Alabama state troopers in a brutal confrontation that later became known as Bloody Sunday. News broadcasts and photographs revealing the senseless cruelty of the segregated South helped to hasten the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, 
which was signed by President Lyndon B. Johnson and guaranteed the black Americans had the right to vote. From 1961 to 1966, Don Lewis would be arrested over 40 times at peaceful demonstrations. He was beaten, injured, and nearly killed countless times. In spite of this, he always remained a vocal advocate for the philosophy of nonviolence. In 1987, John Lewis becomes a member of the U.S. House of Representatives for Georgia's 5th District, a job he would hold until his death. Known as the conscience of the Congress, Lewis has influenced almost every single major civil rights movement of the past century, from voting rights to LGBTQ equality. In 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court invalidates major aspects of the Voting Rights Act Currently, a bill to restore these parts is named after John Lewis, and it's been passed through the House and is currently collecting dust in the Senate. John Lewis would not live to see these rights restored as he died from pancreatic cancer on July 17, 2020. On July 26, 2020, he crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama one last time when his casket traveled the same route over the bridge that he walked during the Bloody Sunday March. The same place where he and countless others helped to lay the foundation for equality and the voting rights of Black Americans. At the time of his death, Congressman Lewis had over 50 honorary degrees. And, and here's a fun fact that I love about him. Did you know that he was known to attend Comic-Con in San Diego cosplaying as himself? That's, that makes him an icon in black history and in nerd history, which speaks to me deeply. Do we have a picture of me at Comic-Con? Uh, I don't want to talk about the bang. Don Lewis often talked about the importance of finding a way to get in the way, of getting into good trouble, necessary trouble, the kind of trouble that outlives us and improves the quality of life for the next generation and beyond. In 2018, he tweeted, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, a year. It's the struggle of a lifetime. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get into good trouble, necessary trouble. The fight for equality that we're in right now is a few details notwithstanding. The same fight that John was in, which is in some ways troubling, how can we be 60 years removed from the height of the civil rights movement and seemingly have moved forward only a few steps? But John's work from the Freedom Riders to his sacrifice on Bloody Sunday reminds us that even if we're moving one step at a time, we're still moving forward. John's legacy will be that of someone whose passion and vigor sturdy the roots of the Voting Rights Act, which paved the way for the advancement of all civil rights across the country for everyone. Every American of any background is in some ways touched by the work of John Lewis and damn, I hope that he finally gets some well-deserved rest. The fight's on our shoulders now. And I don't know about you guys, but I am ready to get into some good trouble. That's what John would have wanted.